and made me better. And welcome to the Breaking Beliefs Podcast. This valuable time is for you to pause in your day and go on your own self journey. Discover the beliefs that are holding you back from living your best life at work and at home. Learn from the guests on this show as they share their inspirational stories on how they found ways to break internal beliefs that were no longer serving them. Because if you believe you can, you will. And our podcast begins now. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs, where I interview Gino Blafari. He is the Chief Executive Officer for Home Services of America. He is also the chairman of HSF Affiliates, which operates the franchise networks of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services and Real Living Real Estate. He is the chairman of both brands, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services and Real Living Real Estate. He has been ranked among top 15 most powerful influential leaders in the residential real estate industry. He was the 2007 Italian Businessman of the Year by the Italian American Heritage Foundation, the 2012 Mentor of the Year by the Buffini Company, and the first and only recipient of the Leadership Award from the Tom Ferry Organization, and so many more awards to name. In this discussion, Gino shares his journey on understanding human mindset, his own as well as others, to create an attitude of abundance versus scarcity. Gino shares his inspirational story, his daily practices, and learnings along the way on how by changing your mindset, the sky is the limit of what you can achieve. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs, and today I'm with Gino from Berkshire Hathaway Services. And Gino, do you want to give a little background on yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Amy. I'm, uh, this is Gino Blafari. I'm with Home Services of America, which is the largest residential real estate company in the world from transactions. And on the franchise side, we also have Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, which was kind of how you introduced me. I'm the, the chairman of that and, and the brand Real Living Real Estate. Right? So it's a, it's a real estate company that has mortgage, title, insurance, brokerage, and franchise. You kind of introduced me as the franchise person. Got it. So okay. thank you so much for being on today. And I met Gino at a recent conference for Berkshire Hathaway that I was keynoting at. And I listened in um, to his session as well, kind of talking about his personal planning he does each day. It was, it was very impressive. So I just love to talk to leaders that can share these types of personal habits that they brought in. But before we get into that, I kind of want to start out in your beginnings um, and what you originally wanted to do when you were a child and just forgetting where we are today and, and how we got there. Okay. Yeah. Well, as a child, um, I was, I was certain I was going to be the next Willie Mays, a baseball player. You know, all kids want to be a, a baseball player or a football player or something like that. So that was kind of like my, in, in, in my mind on there. Then I know my dad always wanted me to be a dentist. So then for a while I thought I wanted to be a dentist. Um, but essentially um, I ended up in high school working at a golf course and a developer bought the golf course there in Silicon Valley as the, as the, um, you know, prices were starting to go up of, of, of land there. And instead of building houses around the golf course, the developer decided to plow the entire golf course under and build build houses. And that was my first introduction to uh, to real estate. So it was kind of, Amy, it was kind of like a journey because um, I graduated from um, college. And right as the time the developer bought the golf course, they had no one to run the golf course. And so I got a great job at age 22 of um, being the golf course superintendent, the pro shop manager, the restaurant manager, the bar manager, the <laughs> swim club manager. I was even the swim team coach. And that came with a house right on the middle of the golf course. Right. Nice. And uh, there were, there were a couple of other little properties that were on the golf course. So all of a sudden I had almost like six rentals myself that came as part of the job. And it was a, a wonderful time. It came to an abrupt ending when they decided to plow it all under. Right. Okay, and that started my that started my real estate journey. Matter of fact, I was on on the job um, because of my reputation for hard work and results in at the golf course. They gave me a job, and all of a sudden, I found myself in construction. 
And so I'm working on in construction, not really being fulfilled. I don't mind hard work, but not being fulfilled. And um, they're on the job site. And one day a little a BMW pulled up and this dapper man got out. And I thought, oh, my gosh, what is he doing? Asked around about him. And I found that he was selling the model homes that we were building. So it was the old, um, that old saying, if a picture's worth a thousand words, the one he portrayed of fun and success caused me immediately then to go out and get a real estate license. Okay. <laughs> So that's, that, that started, that started real estate. Um, so, then from there, go ahead. So before you go on, cause there's a couple things that I, I want to go back to. So you being a baseball player, um, how long were you doing that for? And when did you decide to stop? Oh, I was never, I was never a baseball player. You said, I was, I was, I was listening exactly very carefully to your question. What did you want to be when you were a little kid? Yeah. Well, I wanted to be a baseball player, uh, right? Okay, you know? so, did, so did every other little kid. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Okay. So uh, was okay. your dad a dentist? Is that why? No, no, my dad wasn't, but that was kind of like some sort of ambition that, that he had for me. Oh, you know? so what did he do? Uh, he was a tax accountant. Oh, look at that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had looked at like a dentist would have been a good career versus accounting. I think it was just probably some prestigious type of thing that would, that that he thought was kind of cool for his son to be. I think like a lot of the old um, dads in the old days, old more traditional ways. Um, you know, they they have these aspirations for their kid without the kid even knowing that that's what they want to do. And you're just going to want to try to please your parents, right? Right. So did you yeah. look into going into that path, or how? Did uh, I, I did. I I I I did, but I. Um, realized really quickly that wasn't something I wanted to do. So what ended up being your degree in college? Um, business administration with a con uh, a, um, a concentration in, um, at that time they called it um, behavioral science, which was actually good because it would tail into what you do. It was really kind of like HR management and I had a minor in uh, in labor I kind of was um very interested in in labor and and the history of labor and and the labor unions and things like that interesting and and how that ended up playing out into what I can see you as a leader today is it's very interesting so yeah. so at, so okay so you were helping with the construction so and then started seeing that there's this opportunity in real estate. So what happened from there? Well, what happened was I saw the guy, I saw the guy in there that sounded like it was having a great, great time and do it. So I decided to get a real estate license. I thought I would work with the developer. I ended up not working with the developer and it got me a real estate license. And then I turned my TV off for a year and I did all sorts of studying like that you're into with the you know, mindset. Mine at first was how to be a real estate salesperson. And then it got into like, you know, personal growth and things like that. But um, I started out and I struggled for six whole months, um, you know, just could not for the life of me sell a house. And, and this is not through lack of effort. I had turned my television off for a year. I don't know how many people back then would be able to turn their TV off for a year. And every day, all I listened to was cassettes on how to sell real estate. Right. And uh, it just didn't happen. And then um, one particular day, I got a call from a friend of mine um, and uh, he said, you know, hey, we're thinking about selling our house and we buy another bigger house. So I went out to his house and spent two and a half hours there and found out that he wanted kind of like a pipe dream of what was available. So I was kind of, again, a little bit depressed. This is on a Thursday night because um, he was in Sunnyvale. Back at the time, Sunnyvale um, was much less expensive, Sunnyvale, California, than it is today. And he wanted four bedrooms. He had a three-bedroom home. He wanted two bathrooms. He had a one-bath home. He wanted this special high school and a separate family room. And he wanted it all for under 200000 and that particular house at that time had moved to about 215000 And back in 1985, when interest rates were 14%, if you qualified for two hundred, you didn't qualify for two hundred five or even two hundred ten or certainly two hundred fifteen where this was at. So, um, so that was I was just kind of like depressed. And I remember having a one dollar bill in my pocket for about six months, okay, and and um, uh, just being just just kind of 
depressed, but not letting anyone know that on the outside. So on the inside, I was dying. On the outside, I was, I was kind of depressed. And I had never missed a sales meeting. I go to this one sales meeting where they were putting three offices together, the Sunnyvale office, the, the um, Saratoga office, and the Los Altos office. So in our area here, people aren't familiar with the Bay Area. Sunnyvale's more mom and pop. Los Altos is very high end. Saratoga is pretty high end. And the guy teaching the um, conducting the, the the class there was um, a guy by the name of um, Alan Pinnell, a a um, you know um, a, like a legendary real estate guy at the time. In fact, there's a company named after him. In any case, Alan Pinnell was given that meeting and he was talking and talking and talking and talking. And pretty soon after you're talking so long, I'm kind of like looking around. I'm looking up at the ceiling. I'm looking at this textured ceiling and say, hey, that kind of looks like a dinosaur. And I oh, there's my dog. And I just so happened to look at the wall and I saw the flyer that said coming soon. It said four bedrooms, three bathrooms, separate family rooms, separate dining room, uh, homes. It said all these things that these people wanted. And it was for one hundred ninety nine thousand. I said, oh, my God, a Saratoga agent has mispriced the, the, this, this home. In other words, the comps were showing a higher rate than, than that. So I just got up, ripped that flyer off the wall, walked around and collected every one of the flyers on the desk and, and, and walked out. And I can remember getting eye contact from Alan Pinnell, like, oh, why did we, I was the first new person that they hired to this elite company, Fox and Tarskad, and, and it took them three months, me three months to convince them to hire me. And then they were like, I think we made a mistake for the next right. six months, right? So. So what happens is I drive straight to my friend's house, and, and you'll appreciate this with what your studies are. Uh, Faith's a funny thing because he was the deputy sheriff, and his wife was a nurse, and they happened to be home on Monday. Okay? So here I come up. I knock on the door. I'm Mr. Salesman guy, but I just don't have a sales yet. So I look at him. I smile, and I say, hey, Don, you're looking for a home with four bedrooms, aren't you? And um, that's a little called a tie down, aren't you? Wouldn't it? Shouldn't it? Couldn't it? It's these things you learn. And he said, yeah, yeah, we are. And I go, if they had four bedrooms instead of two bedrooms, that would be better, wouldn't it? And I got, went through the whole thing of the whole deal. And pretty soon now Debbie, his wife, is kind of listening in. And so I knew from all my training that I need to summarize the sale. So I said, oh, Don, if it had four bedrooms, three bathrooms, separate family room, separate dining room, Homestead High School, and, and you could get it. For two hundred thousand, you'd buy it today, wouldn't you? And he goes, "Yeah, we would." And I'm like, "Shit, this shit works, right?" You know, because there's all the stuff I was trained at. So they say, "Follow, follow me," because I don't have a real estate car. I've still got my little sports car, Alfa Romeo, from the golf course. So I have them follow me out to the house. Now, bear in mind, Amy, it says on the flyer, "No show till Friday," and it's Monday. But I'm going to sell this house and then get out of the real estate business. That's not for me. Right. I knock on the I knock on the door. Mr. Taroka answers the door. He's got a paintbrush in his hand. That was in the old days when you fixed your house up, you actually fixed it up yourself. You painted your house yourself. Now we'd be sending painters in and doing all these things. But he answers it. And so I ask him. He says, No, I can't show the house right now. He goes, No show till Friday. So I ask him again. He says no. Now the whole time one of the trainers, Tommy Hopkins, has green grained in my head that there's gonna be six no's before I get a yes. So I'm just going through, asking him a different way, asking him a different way. Finally, I get to the sixth no, and now I'm kind of like sweating. You know, the hair on the back of my neck is up. I look out at the street where my friends are. They're, they're like puzzled. Is everything okay? Because they can, can't hear, but they can see the dialogue going back and forth. Right, Amy? And um, he goes to me, uh, uh, he goes, you're not going to give up, are you? I go, nope. He goes, okay, come on in. So I get them. We come in. We're looking at the house like this because all the walls are painted. And they love it. So we're, we're driving back to their house. All I'm thinking is this, 200000 times 3%, because that's the buyer's agent share of it, yeah. is, is, is um, you know, uh, $6,000 divided by two, because I'm on a 50-50 split. Okay, I'm going to make $3,000, and I'm going to get out of the real estate business. It's not for me. Now, so yeah. that's done. Now, they have to sell their house. So – so I go, I, I go back, I go back, sorry, I got a call. I just had to put do not disturb on my phone. I, I, I go, I, I go back, I go back to my office. Well, actually I go back with this offer that I've written to the two ladies that um, are the listing agents and they're not even sure how I got in. 
But because I'm so naive and so transparent, they actually feel sorry for me, and they help me with the offer, and they accept my offer contingent upon the sale of the house in Sunnyvale. So now I go back to my office. I've never done a listing before. I'm typing this listing up one finger at a time, and I type in 6% because that's what I'm trained to do, and I head off to the house. And I go, Don and Debbie Stats, good news, we got the offer accepted. Now we have to sell your house. So I have this listing agreement. I get to the 6%, and in 20-point 20 20 type, it says it's negotiable. And he goes to me, he goes, well, isn't the commission negotiable? And, of course, I say the only thing I know how to say that I learned on one of those cassette tapes was, yeah, it's negotiable, but I can only go up, you know? He kind of pauses for a second, right? And he, then he initials it. And again, I'm like, oh, this shit really works, right? <laughs> so that happens. So now bear in mind, and this is probably where it will come in for your, for your, your clientele. I've held an, I'm going to hold an open house in, in that, that house now that I've listed. But I've held an open house every weekend for six months as a guy with a $1 bill in his pocket and a dejected, oh, my God, what happened to me attitude. So my physiology was probably hunched over, right? right. Now I'm like, okay, I sold that house. I'm going to sell this one, and I'm getting out of the real estate business. So I'm like that. <laughs> the a Asians are just starting to come into Silicon Valley, and honest to God, a guy comes in with a little, little case, little duffel bag with $162,000 of cash and wants oh to buy the house from me right there. I got to explain to him, no, you do it to a title company, the whole thing. But now I got that deal done. So that's called two sides. So I got the one sale that I sold them, and then I got the listing sold and the buy side. So I really technically got three deals. Now, I managed that next week to get three more deals. So now I've got six transactions. I have no idea what I'm doing in business, but I would show up at the office every day at 6.30 in the morning, which most realtors don't start work at 6.30 in the morning. I sat behind this guy by the name of Mike Ray, who was the most brilliant realtor I had ever met. And that's why I sat right behind him so I could learn from him. He came in at seven o'clock. So many times, Amy, it was just he and I in this room together. And there's going to be a point here for your, for your listeners. Okay. He comes in and I'm numbering my deals and he's looking at me like, what are you doing? What are you doing, Gino? I go, Mike, I'm numbering my deals. I got six deals and that's just it. I got no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> And he, okay. And, and he says, and he says to me, he says to me, you don't want to ever number your deals. And I go, why? And he said this, and this is a defining moment for me. He says, I've been watching you for the last six months. I've never seen anyone try as hard as you, anyone listen to as many tapes, read as many books. He goes, um, you don't want anyone to know you've only got six deals going at one time. And so I said, well, well, how many should I have, Mike? And he goes, you should have 15. Now, 15. Wow. I thought about that a million times after that, because had he been my manager trying to jack me up so I'd sell more houses so the manager looks good, I might not have had the impact. But here was a dude, nothing to do no benefit to him that I right. could do 15 deals, just a man of integrity. And what that did was it changed my self image of myself. Okay. 30 days later, I had 15 deals lined up, ended up. If you went from that first sale in May to the following May, so 52 houses back in 1985 when you didn't have a team, that was more than anyone at the best company in the entire Bay Area, right? So that's what happened there. That's kind of propelled me into real estate. From there, I um, started let, being let recruited. Hold, let me just hold there because – Yeah, sure. I, like you're saying that changed your mindset, and I'm hearing a couple things. He gave you – a, a number to focus on, but I'm also hearing that it was because he was just, he personally cared that you could trust him. He believed <laughs> if what you're, I think what you're looking for, yeah. Anna, he believed what got me was he believed in me. The number would be nothing, 15, right. 10, 20, whatever he said, but he believed in me. And so he changed my own belief in myself. OK, mm -hmm. and as soon as that happened, OK, as a salesperson, you perform how you see yourself. I didn't know that at the time. 
right? right? But I took a different, I was seeing myself now from a different lens as, yeah. as someone that could do 15 deals, right? And I think that's so important. I, I just wanted to hold on that for a moment because um, number one, we don't always understand the impact we have on other people. And he didn't know you were kind of following him, <laughs> like, you know, around um, all those months. And um, he, 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 he knew, he knew, oh, okay. he knew. But and and, and, and he, he, he was brilliant. And he, so he would, he understood why I wanted to sit by him and things like that. Not that it mattered to him, but, right. but he was fully aware that I was sitting behind him for a reason because he was the best guy and I wanted to observe him. Yeah. But he, I, it, you know, because I, I think there's a lot, there's so much um, in that because a lot of times someone like him can feel threatened by a person like you too because he can see that you are someone that could be just as good as him or be a competitor. So in order to um, take yourself out of that and turn around and give you advice like that, to help you along takes a lot of self-confidence in himself to do that too, because I see a lot of leaders that don't do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was, he was well beyond his time as far as number one, he was old enough to be my dad. Mm -hmm. He had already done it and he had studied. He was a student of mindset. He was a student of success. So you're familiar with Jim Rohn. Mm -hmm. Jim Rohn, the philosopher that has a zillion tapes and, 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 a, and a great, great trainer. Um, you're familiar with Anthony Robbins, right? Yeah. Anthony Robbins. Everybody knows Anthony. Anthony worked for Jim Rohn, okay? And Jim Rohn did the same thing that Anthony Robbins did. Well, this guy had worked for Jim Rohn also. So he had a very good premise on mindset and, 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 and keeping your thoughts positive and, and just the different things. He understood success. And, and I know for a second, he wouldn't have been threatened. He had already done it. You right. Know? Yeah. It's just in, in the sales world, you don't get a lot of people helping out like that, you know? So it, that, that's very unique. It, 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 yeah. It, it's, it's not as unique as you think as sales start to change. It's a mindset of abundance opposed to a mindset of scarcity mm -hmm. You do right. get it in a lot of the older salespeople with scarcity. Geez, if I help that person, I'm getting a less one. But that's changed. That's evolved over time as people have studied kind of like you, you, you can't, you, you, it's universal law. You don't get until you give, you right. know? And so the sales, good salespeople are starting to learn that more and more and more. That's why there's so many master, mastermind groups and things like that are big, um, are, are, are really big in real estate right now. But I, I know what you mean before, a scarcity mentality. No, I don't want to tell them that because they might compete against me. Yeah, it's such a pivotal moment of mm -hmm. where you're ready to quit. You feel like you um, aren't good enough or I can't do this and I've done everything. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden that's not for me. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, you're saying it, it's not for me. It's not yeah. for me. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And, and essentially, um, basically, um, really, that's why I think my story is almost every realtor's story. I'll give you one more story from um, sixth grade, which um, I think will be very good for, for, your, um, for your group there, too. Um, so I had an in, incredibly, in, um, uh, incredibly, like, strict sixth grade teacher. Mr. Delanerol. He was um, from India, very, very strict and, and very, very hardcore. And he taught us only English, math, and some poetry. And uh, I can remember my first quarter, Amy, just it was terrible because I, I, I wanted to be a baseball player. I only got an A in his sport, in, in PE. I'd get an A in, in PE, right? And, um, and they were having the parent teacher meeting. And um, so my, my dad took time off from work. My mom's in there. I'm sitting outside in a chair outside the door and the walls like paper thin. So you can hear everything that's going on. And Mr. Delanerol had no, um, no filter. And he just, it wasn't his style to be politically correct. He just told my parents with me listening in what a terrible student I was and how I was not applying myself that I only cared about sports. Right. 
And I can remember being so upset, so upset. My dad had taken time off from work to be there and we're driving home and I'm crying because I can't believe this whole thing. And you get those, those doubts in your head, but it was kind of like, um, you know, the old, when someone says you can't do it, then you kind of like are, you, you've got that little chip on your shoulder. So I decide I'm going to study like mad. And so I study, 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 study. Now, finally, after that first quarter debacle that we have, we have our first test. And I think I did pretty good, but I'm still not confident on it because I don't know yet. Right, Amy? Yeah. And Mr. Delanero, um has all the tests in his hand and he walks up to the front. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I hope I did OK, because now I got like buyer's remorse that maybe I didn't do OK. <laughs> and he, 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 he called me Blifati. And my last name is Blifari, but he would pronounce it Blifati. He would sound it out. He goes, Blifati, come here. So I come up to the front of the room and I'm standing there and I'm thinking, oh, did I blow this test, too? And he holds the test up in there and he goes, the highest grade is Blifati. And if Blifati can get an A. Every one of you can get an A, right? <laughs> and um, uh, that was not really the nicest thing to say about you, right? Right in there. But it was, but he was, um, that, that really is kind of like a true story. And like, so maybe I've had a pretty successful real estate career, but what I tell every new realtor coming in, if Leafody can do it, they <laughs> can do it too. So there's some messages in there, right? Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it just reminded me of my own story. On the, it's so funny how these little things happen. And, and I was actually, while you were talking, thinking about, you know, is that something you're born with? Because I had a fourth grade teacher that hated me. And I don't know why. I remember my parents going to the conference and they came home and said, that teacher does not like you. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I, and I was always trying really hard. And mm -hmm. um she would mark me down on every paper and I go up to her and I'm like, but I got this right. Like, I remember always being confused and she'd mark me down. So what happened was in fifth grade, I got knocked down a level in all my classes because my grades were not what they were supposed to be. So I was so frustrated. And you took these, like, I guess they were like IQ type tests to place you in the grades. And I studied for it. I kept every textbook, every piece of homework from fourth grade. And I studied for this thing because I wanted to get back to where I thought I should be. But I, I do think that there's something within you that's a fighter to do those things. Or are you going to start believing like what you could have done was believed what he said and then just hung your hat for the year. Right, right. So you wonder what what drives that in some and, and how, you know, how others, you know, may take that completely different. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, so after you, you know, got your career going and you were a top sales agent, how did you end up where you are? Um, okay. Um, your so let me pick the store. Let me pick this story up with them with that. So now I'm a successful agent at Fox and Carscadden and I have my little league baseball coach. There comes baseball back in there who had a little company called Contempo Realty and uh, wanted me to come work with him. Um, so I do. And um, I become a partner there and uh, we grow that company um, and we, we sell it in 1997 um, to uh, Realogy, which is the big Coldwell Banker um, the other big real estate company in the country. And I have a, a five-year non-compete that I stay there with, 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 with them as the president of my own, my old company. And then my five-year non-compete is up and the entrepreneurial juices start flowing again. And I, 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 I moved to start another company. So I start this company called Intero. In fact, we're in my old company's conference room right now. I started Intero in 2002, the end of 2002. And um, Intero becomes the fastest organically grown real estate company in history of real estate. So real estate, they've been keeping track for 106 years. It grows organically. In other words, no mergers, no acquisitions, faster than any, any company. We end up doing $1.64 billion in sales our first year. Our next, in perspective for you, there's 80,000 real estate companies. 83 did a billion. And we do 1.64 billion, so we pass 79,000, you know, 79,920 companies in our first year. And the next year, 
we do six and a half billion, all organically, no mergers, no acquisitions. So we become the fastest growing real estate company back to back. That goes, um, so we do Intero from um, 2003, basically. And then in 2014, I'm just driving to one of my managers, um, uh, my manager's uh, offices to give him their quarterly bonus check. And I get a call just completely out of the blue from the chairman of home services, Ron Peltier. And he says, um, you know, Hey Gino, uh, you know, Warren loves real estate. And I didn't realize he was talking about Warren Buffett, but he was. <laughs> and, um, and he said, he just bought a franchise network um, from, from, from Brookfield, which was the old Prudential network and the old um, GMAC network. And they're looking for a CEO and uh, we want to know if you want to do it. We haven't talked to anyone else, but we want to know if you want to do it. I'll call you back in a week. I was kind of like taken back by that because I already had a company. And uh, he called back a week later and I said, you know, um, I really appreciate this offer, but I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm the owner of an independent company right now. It'd be kind of awkward to own in tarot and be the president of a brand. Right. And then he said, well, right. Okay. And he said, well, you know, if you accept this position, We'll make that transition possible for you, and we'll buy in tarot. So that was another interesting piece because we had gone pretty far with Intero, and and maybe um, I'd taken on three more partners at that time, and and they were you know everybody was a little bit restless on you know wanting to do more or have a different role, but there's only so many roles when you have your little company. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the CEO. Sorry, I'm. I'm yeah. the founder. I'm the guy, right? Exactly. And um, um, everybody else has their own ambitions. So it worked out well with the company. So on May uh, 17th, 2014, we sold in Carroll Real Estate Services to um, technically to Warren Buffett, Home Services of America. And I got to tell you, at that time, I had a sense of a real sense of pride because um, Warren Buffett, who is known, you know, worldwide as making prudent business decisions after research not only came to the conclusion that he wanted to buy in tarot but he was fine with me being the ceo of the company that carried his brand name berkshire hathaway we were one of the first ones we're out we're berkshire hathaway home services and we were one of the first ones to be able to use the berkshire name since then wow. berkshire hathaway energy berkshire hathaway auto there's a few other berkshire hathaways but that was a, a pretty cool thing so then i did that job for five years, I grew that network. And then in January of this year, again, I got a call from Ron and he said, you know, look, I'm going to need some more help. Um, you know, we've grown so big. We're the largest real estate company in the world. And um, uh, I, I need, I, I need to replace myself. He was a CEO. I need to replace myself as CEO. And uh, I'd like to know if you'd like to do that. Well, and so that. on January 15th, yeah, on January 15th, I took, um, I, I took on that job. So now I'm the, the, the CEO of the parent company to Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, the franchise brand, it's called HSF Affiliates. And we have mortgage, we have title, we have insurance. So we are really positioned to do what the consumer has been looking for all the time is a one-stop shop. And we can do your mortgage and we can do your title and we can do your insurance you know, we can even sell you a franchise and, and sell you a house. And we can do those five things. And that's, that's what we do. Wow. So that's quite a journey. And um, for meeting you, uh, you have very, um, you're very personable. You know the people around you. Um, you know, it, it, from a personal relationship standpoint, I could pick that up. And so... How do you feel you've been able to keep that authenticity throughout your journey and, and that you're still involved in other people's personal journey? When you're yeah. Them? Yeah. Well, I think you've got to always remember, you know, I, I remember, you know, the success I've had in, in real estate, you know, uh, uh, has been a fair amount by my own effort of hard, but, not at all. The only thing, so many mentors along the way that Mike Ray, you know, um, um, you know, Bob Moles and, and, and Papa Moles, who gave me my um, opportunity at, um, uh, at Contempo, um, you know, um, Jerry Hotman, who was an outside investor that um, uh, lent me money when we built in Tarot. 
um, Ron Peltier having the confidence to ask me to be the CEO of um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway Home Service, the franchise piece, and then Home Services of America. So there's been so many people along the way, and, and some of it's luck, some of it's you're at the right place at the right time. There's all sorts of things that, that kind of play into it. And, and I just always try to be mindful of that. Um, and uh, I mean, once you get up in the, you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, if you have the, you know, CEO, your titles stamped on your forehead, you've lost your way. Right. right. Um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, smugness comes before arrogance. And I believe arrogance is the precursor to disaster. Once you think you know it all, your slide to mediocrity is already beginning, you know? Um, so that's kind of like that, that, that's that piece to always, always remember, you know? And, um, and I always try, I, I remind my, it's part of my routine. I remind myself of these things every single day. And I do, I help people my, my mission is I help people achieve their goals faster than they would in my absence. And now I have the best platform from a real estate aspect. I have the best platform in the world to do that. I didn't realize that you were in the audience. I guess when I talked, I was mm -hmm. talking about, um, I think I was talking about my life plan and sharing yeah, my life plan that day. Right. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so that's, that, that's kind of like it. Yeah. Just be mindful of it. Just be mindful of it. Don't take yourself too, too seriously. Um, uh, because um, uh, it's just not, Hey, a lot of people have, have, um, have helped along the way is it was a journey, you know, even, I mean, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I got title guy, Kevin Barrett. Um, if I needed a property profile, he got that really quick. If I needed this information, he got it really quick. He was there to help me along the way, you know? Yeah. So, uh, one of the things, so, uh, what I was listening to you talk about was kind of your daily practice and, you know, and I don't know if you can do it in a brief way, but just how you think that practice is not, I mean, it's obviously helped you as a human being, but as a leader, um, to keep you grounded as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can, I can say it was, you know, I, I discovered probably in about, um, oh, maybe it might have been even 1986 as I started to study and study and study. I, I discovered that the, um, I had to kind of like have the right mindset, almost almost be like a fearless mindset when I started my day because um, when you eat what you kill as a salesperson, there's a lot to um, sometimes worry about. So I developed this routine and there were a few things that really got me going. And you'll see, um, you'll see athletes listening to like hip hop music or something like that. Mine was um, that poem Redyard, by Rudyard Kipling, that Mr. Delano from sixth grade. It was one of the poems he made us um, memorize, right? And so I had that on my credenza and it would be something I would read every day. And if you, if you ever pull out that poem or anybody listening pulls out that poem, it's got some lines like this. I mean, I could recite it, but I, but I won't, but it's, it's got, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, it's got such great things for leadership or even on this line. If you can bear to hear the truth, you smoke it, spoken, twist it by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. It's got all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, the thing about like never giving up, you know, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you, except the will, which says to them, hold on. I always thought of myself when I was trying to sell the house and the buyer house after house, after house, after house. And it was, and so hold on. I was inspired by that. So Redyard Kipling's one. Also was fortunate enough to have a guy by the name of Og Mandino as a mentor in the 90s. Og Mandino was the, um, wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World, 12 very spiritual books. So, of course, you would relate to Og Mandino very, very much on, on what, you, um, what, what you do there. And in one of his books, Mission Success, there was a piece in there, Amy, and I was listening to it because I'm auditorial. And it, it, got, it was like, I will live today as all good actors do when they are on stage, only in the moment. 
I cannot perform at my best today by regretting my previous acts, mistakes, or worrying about the scenes to come. I'll take off my coat and make dust in the world. I realize the busier I am, the less harm I'm after to suffer, the taster will be my food, the sweeter my sleep, the better satisfied I will be with my place in the world. It's like three minutes of like, oh, now I understand the secret of changing the attitudes of others, and that's to change my own. Or things like, if I walk away from any challenge today, my self-esteem will be forever scarred. If I cease to grow a little, I'll become smaller. I reject the stationary position because it's always the beginning and the end. Um, things like that, you know, I'll keep a smile on my face and in my heart, even when it hurts today. I know the world is a looking glass and gives back to me the reflection of my own soul. So technically what I'd be doing is programming my whole whole brain, okay, even my reticular activating system part of my brain to notice these things throughout the day because they were part of my routine. There was another one that Norman Vincent Peale's book, Think and Grow Rich, he's got a self-confidence formula in there, and, and I know that was um, uh, not um, – uh, think and grow rich was Napoleon Hill. And then Napoleon, uh, uh, there was a self-confidence for, formula for, for, um, uh, for, the, for the other guy I mentioned there. So there was like four things I would read, and that would totally change my state. But I programmed really good stuff into my head right then. And, you know, it kind of like what you focus on expands. You start to notice it, right? You notice it out there. And I noticed, the, noticed to do more of the right things by programming my, those right things in my head. And not focusing on negativity. So I, I think exactly. it, it's, it, was, it was very powerful. And um, yeah. I, I, I love that you shared that. So I'd like to mm -hmm. end the podcast with a few just rapid fire questions. And um, you pick a category. So the category is either family or friends, money, spiritual, or health. Well, you can pick one. I don't need to pick one. You pick one. Well, it's you. You answer. <laughs> okay. What's that? Yeah. What? Hey, do, what, 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 what the heck? Everybody would do them on. Do, let's do one on money just for the heck of it. Okay. All right. Okay. So things or actions I don't have that I want with money. Things or actions I don't have or I don't want with money. That you None. None. Okay. That you don't want. So what do you want that you don't have? I have what I want. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we can pick a different, different okay. one. To, but yeah, no, when it comes to money, I have what I want. You know, I, I have what I want. I've, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I sold the, um, what, the seventh largest real estate company in the country. And you know what I did? I bought this sport coat yeah. five years ago and I'm still, and I'm still wearing it. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> That's what I bought. Okay. Yeah. All I, right. just, I just so happen to be aware. I just so happen to be wearing the one I bought. It's your lucky you know? sports coat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. 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 All right. So things or actions that I don't have that I don't want with money. I don't want to lose it. <laughs> totally makes sense. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then lastly, that I do have that I don't want as far as money. Um, the potential complacency that it could give you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I don't think I have that, but um, you know, um, uh, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm pleased, but not satisfied. Yes. Yes. That's okay. great. So yeah. um, as we end today, and I, I really appreciate you sharing what you've shared. I think it's going to mean a lot to a lot of people. Uh, is there anything you want to make sure that people take away from this conversation that uh, you haven't been able to say, or you just want to make sure like that's a big takeaway for them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you a couple takeaways. Um, the one, and I think I made it pretty clear that if I did it, if they could do it. Yeah. Number one. <laughs> and, and, and not really, what well, whatever really done all that anyway. And then that it's a, um, it's all, it's always a journey. It's not like a, a destination piece. It's a, it's a journey. And um, there's so many things that happen along the way. People that you run into that help you, luck that you might have, you know, all sorts of circumstances sometimes kind of come together. Mm -hmm. And you just have to keep your eyes open to it. Yeah. That's awesome. So 
Thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. And I uh, really appreciate the conversation. And now it is time for our mindful moments segment of this podcast with Gino. And I wanted to reflect upon some of the great teachings that he had to share during his journey of becoming a leader and the work that it takes and perseverance in order to achieve the success and goals that you set out for yourself. So it was a really interesting background of how he started and got his interest in the real estate industry. But even more importantly was what he did in college, um, understanding behavior and human mindset, which ended up helping to serve him and the goals that he set for himself throughout his life. And I loved the part of, with sales that a lot of times people don't succeed in sales because they can't take the rejection. And it doesn't have to be even sales. It can be anything that we go out and ask for, that next promotion, um, someone to help you with a project, whatever it is, it's having the confidence to find the way to ask that question so you get success. And the way he looked at it with uh, six no's before you get a yes, of realizing that there's always another way to ask the question and it has to be negotiable. So if you're going and asking the question selfishly, you're not always going to get the result that you want. And this really serves us whether in business or in our personal life. It's important to understand the needs of the other person and how do you keep pivoting that question to get the outcome that you want, but also to assert, to serve the person that you are trying to get something from, that they are getting something from that as well. And I think that's something that's missing a lot of times when we go out for certain things that we want in our life, we're so focused on what those things are, we're not necessarily taking into consideration what's important to the other person and how do we actually make it so that person feels good about the decision to help as well or to buy, whatever that decision is. I think from the standpoint of perseverance, when he talked about how he basically had no sales and he was working so hard every single day, but the important part was that he showed up. He didn't give up. He set a timeline for himself of how long he was gonna keep doing this for, but until that timeline, was gonna end, he was going to work his fullest every single day. And that started with him showing up at 6.30 in the morning at the office and finding mentors, and I think this is so important, that aren't necessarily finding you or that a corporate entity set you up with. He identified who he wanted to learn from and started sitting behind him or being where he was so that he could learn from them and gain from that. So a lot of times we have mentors that don't even know they are our mentor. But in this case, what ended up being a, a pivotal moment for him is that this mentor started seeing that he was doing that and believed in him that he could make it. And I think that's important as well, that when we understand that we have certain accomplishments. How do we give back to the people that were struggling just like we were when we started out? How do we give them the tips that are gonna make it really important or critical for just getting over that hurdle to accomplish what you want? He also talked about his sixth grade teacher where uh, the teacher really didn't enjoy him as a student, but because of the way that that teacher uh, treated him, he took it on as a challenge rather than taking it personally. And I think a lot of times when people respond to us in ways that we don't expect, we start wondering what's wrong with us instead of realizing what, what their experience is and their perception we don't know. All we know is how we can be the best that we can be. And he took on the challenge and ended up getting his highest grade ever with that teacher. And also the teacher saying, if he could do it, anyone could do it. And so that ended up being a mantra for him as he went through our life. So what type of things can we 
pull out from our experiences and use those as mantras to ignite us and inspire us to stay on the journey even when we are feeling that it's just too hard. Rather than throwing it in, repeating back to those mantras that will help us. Now, he shared his daily practices uh, that he calls a fearless mindset to ensure that every day he shows up with the energy so that he can be the best that he can be for the people around him and himself. And I think we overlook how important it is of how we start our day and how we set our mindset to achieve the things that we want rather than the day happening to us. How do we get the day going the way we want? And he shared a few things that he's done um, during his daily practice. One, he reads his poem from sixth grade that helps him to get inspired and fired up for the day. And he talks about different energy or attitudes he wants to create through the day rather than it just being about himself, it's also about how he affects others. And I think that's important for anything that we want to succeed in life, that we are very aware of how we affect others so that they want to be in our orbit and they want to share energy with us. The other thing is how important these daily practices are in self-confidence building and making sure that he is focused on the things that he wants to be focused on and that if there are things that are coming up for him where he doesn't feel confident, what kind of shifts would he need to make in that day? So all in all, one of the biggest messages I got from, from my conversation with Gino is that it's always a journey, not a destination. And there are so many things that can happen along the way if we stay aware and decide where we might want to pivot along the way to achieve the life that we desire. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Breaking Beliefs podcast. I hope you will take a moment to pause before entering back into your day to reflect on this podcast and note one to two actions you are inspired to do from today's conversation that you could incorporate into your life. To read the full blog and listen back to this episode or any other, you can find them at www.amyvetter.com forward slash Breaking Beliefs Podcast and related videos on my YouTube channel. For daily inspiration, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Amy Vetter CPA. I hope that you will choose to like this and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and more so that you can join us for more inspiration on our next episode.